Thank you so much for joining me for this first ever live streaming sort of test thing that we're doing here uh, with regard to my new book, Getting Real. I actually came out in June, so it's been uh, six months of craziness going all across the country. But one of the great things about doing something like this to be able to live stream is that the book business is just changing so dramatically. And I went to a lot of cities and I met tons of people who love Fox and who wanted to get to know me better through the book. But there are so many places that you can't go visit. And uh, so this is a great way for people to be able to hear about my stories and get a chance to interact with me and chat with me and submit questions and see me behind the scenes and that sort of thing without me having to travel to every city and town and for folks who can't get to those places to be able to uh, feel like they are interacting as well. So, all right, um, getting real. Uh, I decided that I wanted to write my life story uh, after some prodding from agents and such because a lot of times people have impressions of people in the media, television personalities, they think, wow, they've never had any problems, everything came easy to them, you know, they got like the golden phone call that said, hey, do you wanna to come to New York and be a star? And that was really never my life experience at all. So uh, just a couple highlights. I grew up in a small town in Minnesota and I was really fortunate to grow up with, with great values. I have great parents. Uh, my grandfather was the local Lutheran minister in town. And I just happened to click with playing the violin. So the violin became like my life as a child. I was a concert artist and that I thought was gonna be my career. Uh, I also struggled a lot with my weight as a kid. I was, I was a fat kid. So um, I learned how to build my, build my self-esteem from the inside. And I think that that's just really an important life lesson and one of the biggest lessons in this book. Uh, then you ask, well, how, how does a fat little kid from Minnesota <laughs> who happens to play the mean violin become Miss America? Uh, I was as surprised as you were that I actually got involved into the whole program. Uh, but half the points are based on talent. And my mom uh, got a brochure in the mail. She called me up when I was at school studying and said, hey, I think I found something for you to use your violin talent in a different way. And so I worked incredibly hard because I was a novice. I'd never really done pageants before. And I worked really, really hard to accomplish that goal. 25 years since then in the TV business. Um, I talk about how I went from Richmond, Virginia to Cincinnati to Cleveland, Ohio, where I got fired the week after I got married. And the worst part about that was that my boss told me at the time, well, guess what? You'll be absolutely fine now that you have a husband. Well, not really. Um, I had worked really hard. I was in my 30s and it was that was actually an illegal thing to tell me. But um, toughest year of my life. I have great empathy for anyone who's ever lost their job or anyone who is still trying to find employment because there's a certain amount of shame that comes with losing your identity like that and, and trying to get it back. I give tips in this book about how I got back on my feet and trust me, I had to work triply hard and take a job that maybe I didn't really wanna take uh, to do that. Then I went to Dallas and without my husband and uh, then I got a job with CBS in New York and from there I've been at Fox News now for 10 years. I also talk about um, some really personal struggles in this book, like sexual harassment. I talk about a life-threatening stalker that I had for four years. I've never told these stories before, ever. Um, I talk about my struggles with infertility. You know, I always wanted to be a mom. That was like so important to me, no matter how hard and how driven I was to have a great career, I always wanted to be a mom. And um, I struggled with that silent pain that so many other couples go through in not being able to initially have kids. So. Trust me, when I see their cherub faces at night, at night when I put them to bed, I am I'm truly blessed. Um, I still struggle with my weight. I mean, I'm just gonna be really candid and honest. I just have learned how to deal with it a little better and I know how the millions of Americans out there struggle with that. I just wanna show you, see, now this is, <clears throat> yeah, peanuts and almonds. Why are they in Gretchen's office? Because I have been carb free for six weeks, yep. I'm always trying something new. I really have to always have sort of a regimented plan because I, I've been very disciplined when I you know, practice all those hours on the violin and you have to do so much intense studying to do a new show every day. So I like diets that like tell me exactly what to do. So these are my kind of go-to snack around here. Um, what else can I tell you about? Oh, never give up on what you want to accomplish in life. That is my mantra. No matter how old you are, we all have post-it notes on our desks, right? or in our kitchens, stuff that, that we need to do, but we just never get around to it, our hopes and dreams. And I hope through this book that you will be inspired to tackle some of those things that you just have put behind you for a while. And I have my bucket list 
in this book as well, and I'll give you one clue. Two of them begin with the letter P. So see if you can figure out what might be on my bucket list. All right, guys. Hey, I'm joined. I just want to let you know, there's two guys in my office today. I know that sounds a little weird. Uh, two guys, Josh, who I've known before because I did a book signing with him. Great guy. Um, really nice person. And Eric, who I just met today, who's setting up all this live stream stuff, thankfully, because I have no idea how to do any of that. And I also found out they are interior decorators. If I could, if we could pan the camera, you would be able to see how beautiful they made this really not so beautiful office <laughs> become. I mean, I did have the flowers. See, look, I did have the flowers because I spoke somewhere last week and somebody sent these to me, which was really, really nice. But you guys, the way you arranged everything. Live stream interior yeah, decorating. Li pro. Live stream interior. See? They it's have another point. job. But isn't this cool that we can talk to each other this way? I think it's I think it's amazing because it's one thing to do like emails and Facebook and Twitter. It's a whole other thing to have sort of this video interaction. And guess what? I'm going to call one person, lucky right. person. I'm going to try to call that person uh, who's been selected randomly and have a chat with them as a little bit more of a bonus. Cool. Um, what do you want to do now, guys? Yes, yeah, I think we sign some books. Sign some books. I can, if you're cool with me asking you questions that have come in, as yeah. You go, that so we're going to answer some questions test. that yeah. Josh, um, that they, they came from you, the viewers. See now on the book, the page that I signed, I learned this because uh, I've never written a book before. Here's the page that I signed. This is a picture of me when I was six, when I first started playing the violin. Can you guys see that? Can you see that, Eric? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, and actually, the funniest thing is if you take that face and just change the hair a little bit, that's exactly my son. <laughs> it is identical to my son. It's it's really fantastic. My mom sometimes does a double take with him because she's like, wait a minute, are you little Gretchen? Uh, anyway, so this is the page that I sign when I do these especially uh, for you. And yes, my signature has changed dramatically over the years. Yeah. You know, when I was Miss American, I signed so many autographs, it would even change like over a couple of weeks. You know, so I always think I'm going to get flagged by, like, when I'm writing checks. That, is that really Gretchen Carlson? Anyway, okay, who's the first person? Actually, you start on these. You can oh. flat sign that one. You can okay. sign these ones. We put people's names in Oh, you in put here. the names in yeah. there? Yeah, and okay. I'm glad you covered that because one of the questions was, do you really sign each book? Do I really sign each book? Yes, I do. And guess what else I do? And this is something else I write about in the book. I am a huge believer in writing handwritten notes to people to thank them for things. And this is something that's kind of gone away, you know, with email and all that. My kids are gonna like me someday for making them do this same thing. I'm carrying on this tradition because it's just, it's really important to let people know that you appreciated the time that you spent with them um, or you thank them for, you know, having that meeting and, and a handwritten note, I think, I love still receiving them and so I think it's really important to still give them. So, and if you ask me, if you send me an email or something, will you send a picture to me, an autograph? I respond to all those by myself, not my assistant. I sign all the pictures, which are yeah. right over here behind me. Um, and, and I've made a point of always trying to do that. Yeah. So this is to yeah. Christina, yeah. right? Okay. Where, can they e where do they email for that? Oh, well. You don't want to get that out. That's um, they can figure out my email. Yeah. It's not yeah, very hard. It. Yeah. it is not very hard. Good. All right, so this one is to Christina. I'm going to put the post-it right Perfect. on top of it after, Perfect. okay? That works great. I'm going to take it in. Um, you talked about your kids a little bit, so this is the perfect one. This is Kylie from Florida. What is the best piece of parent advice you've ever received? Okay, it's a great question. Um, and I love that to Sophia, she wants me to keep the faith, to write that. Um, that is obviously an important part of my life as well. The best advice is from uh, my own mom. Uh, she was the kind of mom that every night when she put me to bed after we said prayers, she said to me, and I didn't think it was that big of a deal at the time, but she always said to me, and I never forgot, Gretchen, you can be anything you want to be in this world. And that was so important for me to hear that from a self-esteem point of view, especially when I was fat <laughs> um, and not feeling necessarily so great about myself. And she also followed it up with, God has given you many talents and it's your responsibility to make use of those. And it's gonna come with hard work. And so through that, you know, that was sort of my, became my mantra in life. And it's, it's what I tell my kids. I actually say in the book that when I put my kids to bed at night, I don't tell them that they're gonna be lucky, you know? Yeah, there's luck in life, but 
you are in charge of your own destiny with regard to how hard you work. And you're not going to accomplish every goal. And trust me, I've had a lot of hard knocks. And um, I'm not saying that, you know, just because you work hard, you get everything. But it's at least a pretty good start. And so I was so blessed to have a mom tell me that every day. And as I've been traveling around the country for my book signings, I found out from a lot of people that they didn't hear that. And I think it's so, so, so important to not tell our children, you know, like, hey, you're going to win a trophy for everything. I hate that. But that they are small or big gifts they've been given them. And it takes cultivating those and being told by a parent that you can do it. Great. All right, Bill. I wonder if this is my... I have a really good friend, viewer, Bill, in California. I don't know if this is the same Bill or not, but anyway, he wants me to write God bless. We got another question here for you. Yes. What is your favorite part of your show? Favorite part of the real story is being able to do what I call my take that I do every day. It's something that my bosses uh, came to me and said, you know, you've been doing TV for 25 years. I think people want to hear your opinion on certain issues. And even though I do a news show, uh, I do pick out one thing per day and I give it one minute. It can be cultural, it could be parenting advice, it could be fashion. <laughs> it's usually political and uh, it's something that I spend a lot of time crafting before I go out into the studio. Sometimes I have to do a lot of research on it. And today I'm just trying to think of what it was today. Because once you do a live TV show, your brain's like immediately going into the next into the next day. My husband will say to me, who did you interview today? And I'll be like, um, hmm. And it could have been the president. <laughs> uh, so today, oh, my take, the, you know what? This is actually going to be a really popular one, I think. It was on the comparison between what Jimmy Carter did as president in 1979 with Iranians during the Iranian hostage crisis and basically put a ban on visas and also, uh, you know, wanted to investigate students who were here from Iran during that time. Didn't get a lot of blowback back then. And of course, Donald Trump's proposal this week to ban temporarily Muslims coming into this country. So uh, obviously we can't, we can't do that for religious freedoms on religion, but would it be different if Donald Trump had said country of origin? You know, because Jimmy Carter did pretty much the same thing. It was interesting to draw that comparison and leave it up to the viewer to decide. That right. one was for Steve. So that's kind of my favorite part of the show. Um, and I don't know, I just love, I love the ability to be able to um, be so educated on a daily basis about so many, so many different issues. You know, after a while you just build the knowledge, you know, it keeps, like I know so much about the presidential election, but every day I'm adding a new piece to it. And I, I find it fascinating how politics can change on a dime, you know? Somebody can say something, except for Trump, somebody can say something tomorrow, any political candidate, and it could be the beginning or the end of their entire career. It makes it fascinating. All right, this one's to Christine. Another God bless. Love it. Yeah, a lot of these requests had God bless, keep the faith, and then it was a comedy routine. You know why I think that is, Josh, actually? It's because I'm one of the few national news anchors that talks about my faith on the air. And... Also, um, I take a lot. I get a lot of hits for that, yeah. in, in a bad way. Yeah. Uh, I, you, I always say, like, if I read the blogs every day, I wouldn't get out of bed. So why bother? It's, it's smart. Yeah. Sam actually asked something along those lines. I love how dear your faith is to you, and how you talk about it on TV and social media in such a secular world. What makes you so bold about talking about your faith? Yeah. What makes? Uh, well, so my grandfather was a minister, and I grew up in the church, and I had great role models in my parents. Also, both my parents were really involved, and. Listen, that's what I want to pass on to my kids in this ever more, ever more difficult world. I really just believe that faith is a foundation that's important for kids. And listen, they may make a different decision when they get to be adults, but I feel like it's my responsibility as a parent to give them that foundation. And I feel blessed that I had it in my life and still do. My husband and I teach Sunday school together. <laughs> and um, I always know that that's the one hour a day that I, a week that I'm actually gonna see my husband. And we have fun. We, we, we trade off between our kids' ages and their classes. So let's see, most of last year, because it's hard to find teachers, I'm doing it almost full time now. Um, I've been teaching sixth and seventh grade for almost a year now. And then in the spring, I'm gonna move back to my son's class in fifth grade, because he's been saying, mommy, why are you always okay. teaching his sister's class? <laughs> um, yes, so you know what? 
to each their own on their religious feelings and, and values, but I just feel like it's really important to give that to the next generation. Does this book, it just says, stay true, there's no name. Is that all they want? Yeah. Okay. Yep, that would be it. David asked a question. Gretchen, you are such an inspiration and amazing figure. What are your daily routines that allow you to stay beautiful, healthy, and full of energy? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> you know, so I did Fox and Friends for eight years, and I used to set three alarms for 3.45 a.m., and I never once overslept, which was Amazing. miraculous. But uh, I do have to tell you, as much as I love doing that show, uh, it was just a great opportunity when my boss said, hey, do you want to do your own show in the afternoon? And, and so professionally great. Personally for my kids, they started getting to that age where they really needed me at night and to do homework and stuff. So I will say that sleep, uh, as I get older, I think has been beneficial over the last couple of years. I'm a big believer in working out. Um, you know, not so much to have like a bodybuilder kind of body, but because I think it's a great stress reliever. And I think it's really great to spend individual time with yourself, trying to improve yourself. And for me, it's a, it's a stress reliever and I'm thinking about, you know, things that I need to think about for the day, but also I feel better when I'm, when I'm done. Uh, you heard me say I'm on my carb free diet. So right now that's kind of the gimmick that I'm doing, but so far I have to tell you, I got my mom on it. Um, I got my neighbor on it. So we'll see how it goes. I always choose Thanksgiving and Christmas to go on a diet. Smart. Smart or dumb, Age right? Wise. I, don't, I don't know. Smart That's or dumb. Discipline. Yeah. But anyway, uh, thank you for thinking that I look in shape. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. It gets, you know, it gets harder as the years, as the years go by. What, what does a day in the life of Gretchen Carlson look? What does a day in the life? Oh my goodness. Uh, okay. What at a time? So I get up. I get up early because my kids get up early. Um, not as early as I used to, but I get up around six and I immediately, you know, start going to my phones and reading up on all the news that I've missed. I turn on the TV, of course, and um, then we have a conference call. Our first conference call for our show is at eight o'clock, and I'm either already here in New York or I'm still at my um, home. It just depends on what I'm doing that day and traffic to be honest. Um, and then we, we just decide, you know, we, we decide topics that we want to cover. News is ever changing. So maybe what we thought we were going to do the day before has completely changed or it's stayed the same and we're just following up on things. And then, uh, they start putting together all the segments. So producers will talk to all the guests and get their points of view. And then they send all that information to me and, uh, I start studying it. You know, it's really like an intensive studying for a final almost every day. Like I said, you building on knowledge that you already have. But sometimes the segments are brand new, and I write all my own questions. I, uh, I, I go in and I uh, amend all of the scripts and stories that I'm reading because I want it to sound more like it's in my voice. And then we have another conference call at 11, and uh, then I really hone in on everything. I write my take, and then I go up to the, uh, well, before that I get hair and makeup done. Whew. Thank goodness for those ladies. Thank goodness, because this, this face at home on the weekends, no makeup, no nice hair. Uh, in fact, my son said to me when I started doing the afternoon show and he wasn't used to seeing me with my TV makeup on, he did a double take one day and he goes, Mommy, what happened to your face? <laughs> he didn't like me with all this makeup on. Um, anyway, so then I go up to, I go, well, down actually to the studio and get my makeup touched up again and last minute things, that's about 1.30. And then I shoot a couple of teases telling folks what's going to be coming up on the show. And then the show starts at 2 o'clock, and it goes by really fast for an hour. Then we go into meetings after and immediately talk about what do we want to do for tomorrow. And, you know, it's kind of hard. You, you kind of always have to stay in the loop even when you go on vacation. Yeah. You can't really take can't that learn. big of a break. But uh, it definitely – TV is a job for people who don't want to sit behind a desk, even though I am right now. Uh they don't, you know, if you want to have something new and exciting every single day and not have the monotony of the same thing, TV's a very good job to do. It keeps you on your feet all the time. This one's Debris. I love that name. So how, what time do you get to the building and what time do you end up leaving? What? Well, so it depends. Uh, some mornings I come into the city extra early to go to the gym. Uh, and then I would leave, you know, around 6, 6, 6, 6.30, something like that. Um what I've learned about the traffic in New York is that if I'm not going to come into the gym, I leave a little bit later because you end up spending all that time in the car anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of wasted time. You, you talked about makeup, and, and Jennifer had a question. Why did you go makeup-free on an episode of Real Story? 
Yeah, I did go makeup free. Uh, so back to the self-esteem piece of my book and just sort of how I've chosen to live my life. I just think it's really, really, really important to build your self-esteem from the inside of your soul. And I think especially today with Photoshopping and, and unrealistic expectations in magazines, especially for young women, but young men too, and social media and how vile the comments can be and, and degrading to young people, that it was really important for me to show that my inner beauty had nothing to do with the makeup on my face, even at my age. And so when I did that, I was the first cable news host to, to do that. And my guest for the day, we were celebrating the International Day of the Girl, so we had a, a good reason to do it as well. She also did not wear any makeup. And, uh, you know, I think it was just really, really important. I'd, I'd like to do it again, actually, in the future. And my son would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> and then several of these people just wanted the book personalized. I'm sorry. Just my signature? I did not want it personalized. Probably for a gift. Okay. Uh, for Christmas. With Christmas coming up and Hanukkah. You know what? Uh, so my, my son has uh, some, some Jewish friends in his class, and he's learning so much about Hanukkah. And what he loves about it is that they get presents every night. That's fantastic. <laughs> I know. For a week. So what are we on now? Like the fourth or fifth night? Something like that. With presents. Um, yes. One, one individual asked, will you write another book? Will I write another book? Uh, well... What I found out through this process was that it was actually easier to write the book than it was to market it. Marketing, you know, it's that's why Josh and Eric are doing this amazing new live stream thing because this is really the way in which we're moving forward to try and interact with with people. Um, I I probably will. I'm not thinking about it exactly right now, but if I had to guess, it would be something along the lines for for teens. Even though this book is also really good for teens, you know. This book is great for, well, any age group, actually, to be motivated to do accomplished goals. How long did it take you to write this book? How long did it take? Uh, it took me about a year and a half. The best part, here's the secret behind it. My mom, she was my inspiration, but all, also, she gave me 34 scrapbooks that she made for me when wow. I was a kid. Yeah, isn't that unbelievable? She did it for all the kids in our family. And so it made it the process so much easier for me to go through. You know, like I wanted to find out, when was the first year I performed my violin with the Minnesota Orchestra? You know, well, that was 1970-whatever, because she had all the newspaper clippings in my scrapbooks and all the dates. And so that really, really, really helped the chronological process of writing a memoir. Yeah. And guess who's doing scrapbooks for her kids? <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Making me feel guilty, but I do. I do have to tell you, I, I love it, and my kids already love going back and you know looking at when they were babies and all that. So it's worth it. Is that where the photos came from in the book? So, luckily, my brother-in-law. You guys are too young to remember this, but we used to do pictures on slides. Yeah. And every Christmas, my dad would show all the slides from when we grew up, and we've seen all these pictures a million times, but we'd still laugh, and it was so great. My brother-in-law took all those slides and made them digital and put them on CDs. So when I was going, I looked through thousands of pictures to pick just 20. Let me show you. Okay, so these are some of the pictures and thousands that I went through to try and decide to give kind of a great overview of my life. So here... See, my hometown is the Halloween capital of the world, so I had to choose me in a Halloween costume. <laughs> yeah, covering up my chubbiness. Where's your hometown? Uh, Anoka, Minnesota. Halloween capital of the world. Um, the yeah, these are my parents when my dad was courting my mom in a snazzy car. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, and then all the women in my family, my great-grandmother, my grandma, um, my sister, myself, and my mom. Um, my grandfather, who I told you about, was the minister. Me playing sports. I, I was a tomboy. I loved playing sports until my mom made me quit because my, my violin fingers were sort of my... Um, livelihood and I broke my finger playing football she was like that's it you're not doing sports anymore as long as you're gonna be a, a violinist so then there's lots of pictures of violin and here when I won Miss America um, with Ronald Reagan this see the same pictures in my office right here Can we yeah take it down, down. Yeah. yep um, and you know I was just at the Reagan ranch speaking and I was at the Reagan library for also book, speaking right? for the book yeah. uh-huh and place. it was fascinating to see all of that since I had the opportunity to meet him in the Oval Office mm -hmm. when I became Miss America. Yeah, so here it is. It needs to be dusted. 
but um, great pick. yeah, isn't that a great pick? So this is actually Senator Rudy Boswich, who was a Republican from Minnesota, which is my home state, and his wife. And then this was Ellie Ross, who traveled with me as Miss America. We had travel companions who um, made sure that we behaved. Is that 1989? And, you yeah, this was in 89. And here's, uh, yeah, my hair's changed a little bit, right? <laughs> Maybe my waistline a tiny uh, bit. Um, and President Reagan. I was just at the ranch, and, you know, they left it exactly like he left it 20 years ago. His clothes were still in the closet. And he slept in two twin beds with Nancy. Uh, they put them together with zippets. It was unbelievable. And he was so tall, the bed was short, so they had a footstool at the end so that he could feel comfortable. Um, so anyway, yeah, there's, there's, so there's a lot of great pictures in my life here. My, my kids, my wedding, um, some of my events uh, covering like the royal wedding and things like that. And, um, and of course, being with the troops, which is another thing that I talk about frequently on my show is patriotism. Um, we got a question from David Short. Why Fox News? What was the draw to join them? We enjoy, we enjoyed watching you every morning. Uh, you brought the news to us on Fox sometimes. Thank you. God bless. Uh, what was the impetus for joining Fox? Yeah. Yeah. So, what happened was I was doing the Saturday early show at CBS, and so I was doing a morning show one day a week, and that was my ultimate goal in TV, mainly because when I was covering a bunch of serious news, I would send my tapes to my mom, and this was before the internet, and she would say, "Oh, Gretchen, I just..." I think you're doing a great job, but could you smile a little more when you're reporting so people can get a sense of who you really are? And I'd be like, Mom, I'm covering murders and fires. <laughs> I can't really, like, yuck it up. So when I got a chance to do the morning show, um, it really allowed me to showcase all aspects of my personality. And But I was only doing it one day a week at CBS. And so I got the opportunity to come to Fox and do that five days a week. And it was just, you know, a wonderful opportunity, and it was too good to pass up. So... I did that for eight years, and then I've been doing this for two. I've been at Fox now ten years, and I can Congrats. always base it on my son's age because he was only three months when I came here. Yeah, so Keep I always he keeps me straight on the years. Keeps track of both things. Yes. This is a totally random one. What is your favorite destination that you've ever traveled to? My favorite. So I love to travel, and luckily my husband uh, does as well. How do you find the time? Um, well, we make we make the time. Yeah. Uh, you know what, I think it's really, really important to spend time with your spouse alone and also with your kids and just have that downtime, especially when you have uh, two people working in a marriage. It's just, you know, some weeks go by where we're just hardly seeing each other and everyone's so busy. So I think it's really important and we both both love to travel. I would, if I had to pick, I would say uh, Stockholm, Sweden, just because I am Swedish. I'm 100% Swedish. And my, my family was originally from Sweden, and I love tracing, like, ethnicity and roots. And one of the most fantastic things growing up as a kid was being able to say, I'm 100% of something, <laughs> you know? And it was even unusual then. It's really unusual now. Yeah. And so if I had to choose, I would say Sweden for its beauty and its, its culture and um, my ethnicity. That's a good, that's a, that's a fair, fair choice. Uh, going along the list of favorites, what's your favorite book besides your own? Um, since O'Reilly's office is right next to me, should I say <laughs> Killing Reagan? Better. He might be listening in. Better. What about Killing Patton? <laughs> <laughs> what about Killing Kennedy? Killing Jesus. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, Killing Jesus. Thank you, Josh. You killing Lincoln? Whew. He's, oh. yep. Whew. He's not going to come He's not gonna come in, in here. Um, yeah, this is always a hard one. Um, Okay, I'm going to say something that, that just because there are just too many other people, I'll offend if they're authors, but I'm not going to offend these people because they're not here anymore. How about the Bible? Good. Um, yeah. Actually, and I teach it every Sunday, and I think it's really important to acquaint kids with the Bible as not like this scary document, but something that they can relate yeah. to, their, to their life, even though it's kind of hard to understand sometimes. Um, yeah, the Bible is a fascinating. It's actually on my bucket list to read it from cover to cover again at some point and that would take quite a long time I think yeah. but it's on my bucket list probably the best stories ever written for sure yes no stories. Um, another favorite question what type of music do you like to listen to and who is your favorite band or artist oh my gosh I know see it's so hard for me to do just like one choice this was my yeah. problem in college 
Like I couldn't decide on my major forever and ever and ever. Luckily, you didn't have to declare until you were a junior at Stanford because I just, I love so many things. It's actually why I chose not to only do music in my life because I just couldn't decide. I am, um, I love all kinds of music, obviously classical because that was my passion when I was a kid. But I love, you know, top 40, I love jazz. And I would have to say Steely Dan is one of my favorite bands. Maybe dating myself with that. Uh, but But I still love their music um i mean i could go on and on and pick i also love dire straits oh acdc yes yeah Australian. you know you know my nickname in the book bad blank <laughs> you have to read the book yeah, yeah you have to read the book in a good way in a good way but i do like acdc don't i remember when back in black came out i was in seventh grade and um my favorite album for a long time. Legends. Yes. Um, what are some of your family Christmas traditions? Family Christmas traditions? Well, I have a ton because they're mostly Swedish. And the bad thing is you don't really want to eat any of the food uh, that, that is a Swedish tradition. There's something called lutfisk, which is codfish. The only problem is they soak it in lye, which is the same stuff you make soap out of. And it's like a delicacy, and you get it from the butcher in Minnesota. And you have to keep it in the garage when you get it because it stinks so bad. And you have to cook it in foil because it blackens any other real nice pan. And it's the consistency of jellyfish with bones in it. Mmm, mm. yummy. And you would either put uh, melted butter over it or you put this white, gluey cream sauce. And my grandfather used to go to a Ludifus dinner at a church every single night of December. He would just go from one to the next to the next to the next because he loved it so much. So after a while, it, it actually became kind of an acquired taste for those of us who didn't love it on the first bite and when he passed away my mom stopped my mom stopped making it and so I haven't had it for about 10 years but food with the Swedish culture is a big thing and also we open all our presents on Christmas Eve and uh, Santa does not wrap the gifts for the next morning and why on Christmas Eve does she have the full Christmas day no it's like a Swedish thing yeah. And also, oh, here's a good one. The Swedish Santa is skinny. <laughs> yes, Just I have a figurine red. of him at home. He's like really thin. And so we put out extra cookies at our right. house because yeah. we really need to fatten up yeah. our Swedish Santa. Mm-hmm. This is a good one. Is there a moment or an event during your Fox career that stands out above the rest? Wow. Uh, lots, lots of them. Um, I've had some pretty tough interviews with um, some folks who probably didn't like the outcome so much. Uh, one in particular with President Obama's former spokesperson, Robert Gibbs, where he like tried to challenge me and he was asking me the questions eventually. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is, not, this is not how we do interviews. I actually interview and you answer the questions, except you're not really answering the questions. And so I basically eventually told him he had two strikes and in baseball, three strikes, you're out. And uh, because he wasn't answering the question. So that was a that was a pretty famous interview on YouTube. Um, I've also had some really good ones with Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who's the head of the DNC. And of course, you know, what happens is you interview, I'll show you, you interview every presidential candidate. And so like one morning on Fox and Friends, I interviewed, I think, eight presidential candidates. Oh, yeah, over the course of three hours. This is a picture of Barack Obama when he was a senator and he had written uh, Audacity of Hope, right? That's the name of it? And uh, he came on Fox and Friends and he has never come back. (laughs) When he became president, he would not, he would not come on the show. Um, Was that 06, 07? Yeah, this was right when I started Fox and Friends. So yeah, that was, um, don't look behind here, there's a lot of dust. Uh, But anyway, yeah, that was, um, oh, and this was, this is a great picture. This is when my, my five-year-old son threw out the first pitch at the Mets game on Fox and Friends Day, and that's Brian Kilmeade behind here and, and me anxiously awaiting because it was actually my turn to throw out the pitch that year. And, I mean, I'm, I like sports. I love sports. But I thought it might be better if my son did it. And he, he was so excited, and we were standing on the sidelines, and right before they were going to announce his name, he kind of looked around at everyone in the stadium, and he went, Mama, I don't want to throw ball anymore. <laughs> And I said, 
I said, oh no. I said, yeah, no, you do, you know? And I was trying to distract him. He's like, no, mommy, I, I don't. He just turns around and starts walking to the dugout. I'm like, oh gosh, this means I might have to do this. But then luckily they said, and now, you know, here he comes, Gretchen. So he, he threw a perfect strike. He went right out there, didn't even hesitate for a second, threw the ball. And he made it? Did he make it? He made it. Um, and he is my little statistician. He, uh, my husband's a baseball agent, so he comes by it honestly. But he, you can ask him any game that happened, any team, and he will tell you what the score was, what the, um, yeah. Is he so playing? Is he on the team? He plays every single sport except lacrosse. Amazing. Yeah. Well, that's understandable. And this, look at this is something else cute I have in my office because this reminds me of Minnesota every day. Somebody made this for me. This is what a real license plate looks like in Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes, even though it's really 20,000. And I think there was some stat that you can't drive a mile in Minnesota without coming across a lake, which is pretty spectacular. And then I have a lot of these medals that you get from members of the military, you know, these special mm -hmm. coins that they give you. Mm -hmm. And I started collecting them. I mean, I have a, a ton up there. And they're all, you know, unique. And they, when they shake your hand, they hand you one of these coins. You guys have probably come yeah. across that. Yeah. Um, and so those are all up there and meaningful. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Eric's gonna still wear it. Why do I have a bottle of Kahlua in here that has some of it gone? Because on my last day of Fox and Friends, my hair and makeup people spiked my coffee <laughs> with Kahlua as a surprise and a Party you know day. congratulations. And they had balloons everywhere. And uh, I have to tell you, I only could take a couple sips because at five thirty in the morning, yeah, <laughs> I didn't bet. really. Yeah. Oh, and then this is the one of the best things a viewer ever sent me was this magazine cover called The Real Story. Isn't that amazing? Great. And she preserved it and everything. Um, and this was from, I don't know, like the 40s or the 50s or something. But it was a real magazine called uh, The Real Story. A viewer from Alaska sent this to me. That's amazing. Yeah, pretty cool, right? So, so we have selected Bill, who, who actually, asked, I think you mentioned Bill was a big fan, um, to call. He's got two questions that he's asked you. Okay. And so it, we're going to just dial him on this phone. On which phone? On this My phone. My phone? Okay. Yeah. we got to dial nine. And uh, is it, it has to be Bill, right? Yeah. And we'll put on speaker so they can hear it if that's cool. Oh, okay. Bill? Yes. It's Gretchen Carlson. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. You're the lucky winner of the call. I'm, I'm the luckiest guy in the world right now. Oh. Is this my friend Bill from California? Yes, it is. Wow. Well, you are a true fan, Bill, and I appreciate uh, all your nice tweets and coming to visit me when I come out to California for my book. You are a great fan. In fact, I want everyone to know that Bill has given me both of these mugs that I have right here in my office. These are from Bill. So I keep all the stuff you give me, Bill, and I really appreciate you being a great fan. Thank you. All right. You don't have to work today? Uh, well, I work at night, so, uh, so, so I'm free the rest of the day. Fantastic. So you can always watch the real story. Uh, every day. All right. So, so Bill has a great question. How you asked you, a question, and Josh is going to read it. How do you keep people from letting the events of the world change your positive attitude? Good question, Bill. Uh, so how do I keep myself from letting the events of the world? You know what? Um, it's especially important when I go home to my kids because I can't really uh, show them what I've been talking about all day long because I don't want to scare them. And so I have good practice in trying to... Um, remove all those thoughts before I walk into the door because I, I don't want to scare them, especially with all this recent talk about terrorism and the safety of our world. So I really just, um, when I come into work, I'm 100% at work. I talk about this in the book. And when I go home, I'm 100% with my kids. And I just sort of separate my brain into two different areas. You, you gotta, because especially my son is really scared of terrorism and has a lot of questions for me. And I just don't want to scare him further, so I separate it all the minute I walk in the door. That's great. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's great. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. No, it certainly isn't. I mean, I think it's probably akin to doctors and, you know, treating patients and when they come home, like, how do you not think about that all day, 
all day long. But um, anyway, Bill, I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Maybe I'll see you in California again soon. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting anytime. All right. Take care, Bill. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Very cool. Cool. And as we have been signing, we actually had more people uh, request personalized books. So okay. I'm slide these up to you, and we've still got more questions. One that is right here is, do you still play violin? Oh, well, that is the cliffhanger at the end of Getting Real. <laughs> they got to read the book. Got to read. Uh, actually, it's in the, pro in the prologue, and it's actually very, um, it's a very emotional topic for me. In fact, when I was doing the audio book, uh, I had I was overcome with emotion. I didn't think I really would be, and I was kind of embarrassed because obviously when you're reading and they're taping, yeah. and I was sniffling, you know, and stuff. I'm like, oh great, I'm gonna have to do all this again. And uh, I I looked out the window of the audio booth to the producer and to the engineers there, and they were all crying. And so I knew then that the book had like this depth to it that people would be able to relate to even if they've never played the violin or given something up like that and wondered if they should go back to it. We've all maybe had experiences like that where we think, wow, why didn't I do that? Or I should have done this. And they actually kept the audio like it was because they thought it was so powerful. Real. Um, so it's real, yeah. that's right, getting real, thank you. So you'll find out at the end of the book whether or not I have done that. Got to read it. Um, what are you most looking forward to as we head into next year? Another question that came in. An even year. Okay, I'm not yes. really that superstitious, but kind of. I uh, I like even years better than odd years. I don't even know why, because I got married in an odd year, and both my kids were born in odd years. <laughs> but I, and I was born in an even year. I just, there's something about even numbers that I that I like. Yeah. So that would be, well, and then let, on a much more serious note, uh, let me just hope that we can feel safe about our country. Mm -hmm. Deanna Holmes asked, uh, we homeschooled our children. What advice would you have for homeschooling parents? Oh my gosh, that is growing so, so much. I mean, it used to be that I didn't know anyone who was homeschooled, and now it's, uh, it's really changed. In fact, uh, one of the Miss Americas just from a couple of years ago was, was homeschooled. And, you know, I think it's going to continue to grow because a lot of families feel like the schools are indoctrinating their kids with messages politically that they don't want them to hear. And they at least would like it to be fair and balanced and they don't feel like they're getting that education in school. I think that's one of the reasons. And I think some people do it for religious purposes. But I think it's going to, you know, I think it's going to continue to grow there was a case that we that we covered on the real story about whether or not homeschooled kids should be able to participate in sports at public schools, which is an interesting discussion because you're already you know you're paying the taxes, so you could argue that you should be able to do that. And then because I guess my own personal feeling would be that I know how much my kids love doing those activities at school, and so I would wonder about the socialization for them a little. But I have to tell you, the friends I have who homeschool. They all get together. They go on field trips together. They, I guess sports would be the one piece that's missing, unless you play on a town team or something like that. But I definitely think it's going to continue to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Was there a particular part of your book um, that ended up being your favorite? Favorite story, favorite chapter? Um, yes. I am not really a revengeful, revengeful kind of person, but I tell the story in the beginning. <laughs> There's one time. I tell the story in the beginning of the book about how right after I became Miss America, the first press conference I came to in New York, there was a female reporter, unfortunately, who made it her mission that day to take me down. And it was really unfortunate. I had been dubbed like that I was smart because I was a student at Stanford. And I thought, oh, wow, this headline's going to be good for my year. Well, no, because then she decided to give me a test during the press conference and try and prove that I was stupid. So she asked me all these questions like, who's on the $100 bill, what year did the Vietnam War end, who's Mary Jo Kopechny, blah, blah, blah. And then she finally said, have you ever done drugs? And her last wonderful question was, have you ever had sex? And that was pretty demoralizing for a 22-year-old woman who had just you know, accomplished something pretty spectacular. And so I ran into this reporter 12 years later when I was working for CBS and we were covering an event in New York City. 
and I saw her and I you know when you have those moments and I thought should I say something and then I just decided when I got done with my live reports I'm I'm gonna do it and I went up to her and she had no idea who I was I said hi Penny I said my name's Gretchen Carlson I know you have no idea who I am but I was the Miss America that you tried to take down in the press conference and I just wanted to let you know that I'm now a correspondent for CBS News and you're not <laughs> and I immediately like turned around and like walked away as fast as I could uh, so I have no idea how she react I've never seen her she since didn't shout out to you. no she didn't shout out to me but uh, I write about it in the book because it felt pretty darn good yeah. not that I'm advocating that you should do that with all your enemies but we all have our lists right and um, you know, sometimes, or all the time, you got to stick up for yourself. Author's privilege. You have to do that if you write a book. Yeah. These favorite questions uh, keep coming in, so here's another one for you. What is your favorite movie or TV show uh, right now? Wow, I wish I could tell this really secret thing, but I can't. Because I'm going to be in a really fantastic TV show coming up. So maybe you watch out for that. But I can't tell you what it is. Is this one really to a Gretchen? Yes. Wow, really cool. Is. I love that. Somebody named their baby in Minnesota when I was Miss America Gretchen Carlson. So there's another Gretchen Carlson floating around. I mean, there's many. But um, Okay, so favorite TV show. I'm not going to say that one. Uh, right now I'm watching uh, Orange is the New Black when I work out, which is, yeah. you know, interesting. And... I love watching all the cooking shows with my kids, even though I don't cook, because I think I like the competition aspect of it, so I love watching Chopped with my kids. And my kids actually do Chopped at home, compete against their, their cousins. And then, you know what else I watch, full disclosure? I watch a lot of those Real Housewives shows because when I'm going to bed at night, speaking of all the world's problems, um, I just wanna be able to like, veg and not really think about too many serious things and live vicariously through all their wonderful clothes and antics. So um, those are the shows they watch. I watch. You know what's so weird is that the more TV channels that we've gotten, the less I find myself watching TV because it's become so complicated to figure out when shows are on and what you want to watch. And So if anyone has any good ideas for what I should be watching, my husband watches Homeland. I meant to start watching that but I haven't. Um, but let me know if you have any other good ideas. This is a really interesting question. In what ways do the differences in your and your husband's careers help you to connect? Mm. Yeah. Uh, my husband and I are great business partners. We trust each other implicitly on business decisions. And we sort of had this... Um, soulmate kind of experience right away because I had sacrificed so much of my childhood to music and he had sacrificed so much of his child to being an amazing baseball player. And so it was like we understood each other without really having to have the conversation. And that was just really, really important because there's a lot of pain that comes with these solo endeavors, um, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of time not with your friends. and. So it was just this understanding we had, not to mention the understanding of working incredibly hard, discipline, all of these sort of life lessons that were great for a partnership because that's the way we want to raise our kids and live our lives, you know, raise our kids in the same way. Um, I would be a horrible agent. <laughs> and he and I always joke about this because I ask questions for a living. I'm very inquisitive. I'm curious. And I'll ask him stuff about some of his players and he'll be like, I don't know. I didn't ask. And I'll be like, why not? And he'll be like, because I don't want to know. And I, if I if I was an agent, I'd be asking all the questions and I'd be getting in trouble. So <laughs> he's perfect for his job, and I guess I'm good for mine. Yeah, good fit. This is a uh, one from Rebecca in Arizona. Um, who inspires you in your career life and personal life the most, and why? In my career life or my personal life? It's uh, it, the, the question as it reads is who inspires you in your career life and personal life the most. So yeah. So the personal life is my is my mom, uh, but I learned all my drive and passion from from my mom. Um, I learned one of life's greatest lessons, even more so maybe than drive and passion, is humility from my father. Um, and career wise, I have had some fantastic bosses, 
and I write about them in the book uh, because specifically some of my female bosses really pushed me hard and it was kind of a sink or swim mentality. My first job in Richmond, Virginia, I knew nothing about TV. I was going to be a lawyer. Like I had no business like being in TV right away because I just I hadn't studied it in school or anything. And so I really had to learn on the job. And after about six months at this job, this new boss came in. She said, you are the new political reporter. I said, what? She said, yep, you're going to go down and cover the governor every day. And back then, this is 25 years ago, I was the only woman, for the most part, in TV covering the governor on a daily basis. So it was a very nerve-wracking situation, and I had to work so, 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 so hard. And it really was sink or swim. So I had other situations like that with bosses who really put me in difficult situations, but in the end it was like the best thing that ever happened to me uh, to make me branch out and, and grow as a reporter. Someone asked two questions about uh, 1989. One was what doors were open um, once you were crowned Miss America in 1989, and also uh, you said this isn't goodbye, this is hell of a new beginning. What did you mean by that? Wow, somebody really researched that. Yeah. So that, you know, like in the little speech when you see Miss America going down the runway going, bye. Um, somebody said in the book, I talk about it, uh, when, when the old Miss America ends and the new one and everyone's congratulating her, one little kid said, hey, there goes the old Miss America over there. <laughs> That's literally how it is. Like you, you really need to be, um, you really need to be sure of who you are and what you want to do because you have to strike when the iron's hot, you know. Because uh, you're not, you're not Miss America anymore. Suddenly you're, if you were famous for an instant moment, you're, you're kind of not anymore. And you really have to figure that out psychologically and then also figure out, okay, how am I going to use this wonderful achievement to accomplish something else? And that's where my life values and my parents and my discipline in playing the violin really kicked in. You know, it was like, okay, I want to use this as a stepping stone. So it was a stepping stone to new beginnings. And that's really the way in which I have looked at my Miss America experience. It gave me this wonderful platform to find out that I was interested in television. And um, it, it gave me this wonderful opportunity to meet new people on a daily basis and communicate with them and give speeches. I mean, I, one of the first experiences the week after I was Miss America, I was at a dinner for 2,000 people in Atlanta. And I tell the story in the book. The guy in charge came up to me right before dessert and he said, oh, I just want to give you five minutes before your keynote. And I said, what? And he goes, yeah, you're giving the keynote address. I said, oh. I said, okay. And I had no idea I was giving a speech. And I said, well, how long would you like me to speak? And he said, oh, just 45 minutes. So I went into the bathroom with a napkin like this, and I had a pencil, and I just wrote, I had five minutes to write down bullet points, and I went out and gave a speech. So look, you learn how to communicate during that year because you're put on the spot constantly. And you're forced to act a lot older than you actually really are. And those are amazing skills that I have taken with me every single day. People say to me, well, how is playing the violin or being Miss America similar to what you do on television every day? And it's totally analogous. You know, the violin, like walking out on the stage and seeing the audience and performing is the same thing as going into the studio and seeing the red light on the camera and, and speaking to people and communicating thoughts with them. It's the same thing as pouring your heart out with your music. And being Miss America was similar in the sense that you were communicating in that way with so many you know, different people. So I just really honed those skills that year. And you know, it was a great jumping off point. Yeah. yeah. We've got about 45 seconds left. We're still got some That's books it? that we're going to sign. Yeah, it went by super fast. 45 seconds. Wait a minute. What else do I need to show in my office? Right. Behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, cards. We're cards for my kids. What else can I show you? Oh, you hit all my... You hit all my hairsprays over you there. Hit all, you hit, all your, <laughs> hit it all. You hit it all. Um, this is by Peter Max. Can you see that yeah, painting? Isn't that right. cool? Yeah. Oh, and this was from my first movie that I acted in, Persecuted, which was fantastic, a fa fantastic opportunity. Um, yeah, I wish I could show you more stuff. What else do you want to ask me in 20 seconds? you got 15 seconds. You're, this is it. Oh, we'll, we'll sign all the books. Okay, we'll sign all the books. And thank you so much for supporting me and for watching uh, The Real Story. I really, really appreciate it. I love interacting with the viewers. And so thanks much.